morning, everyone. My name is uh, Stephanie Penzel, and I'm from Germany. Currently, I'm doing my PhD at the Leipzig University of Applied Science. And today, I'm going to tell you something about the prototypical investigation of the use of fuzzy measurement data in a case study in water analysis. The associated uh, position paper was uh, written in cooperation with Professor Matthias Ruder from the Leipzig University of Applied Science, with Dr. Helko Borster from the uh, Hemel Center for Environmental Research, and with Professor Arthur Kanun from the Chemnitz University of Technology. So here you can see uh, the outline for the presentation today. I will start with a short introduction, following by the methodical basics, and then going to the main part, the research results and the discussion. And at the end, uh, there will be a short conclusion and a short outlook. So we have global challenges posed by pollution and hazardous system substance in water. I'm sure you have uh, seen this picture before, especially that on the right side, unfortunately. Um, so when we have pollutions in the water, for example, like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbonates or uh, other substances, which are at first place not dangerous, but if they get big, uh, we have too much of them, they get really dangerous and we have pollution in the water. This can uh, follow to mass algae crowds or to enormous fish uh, dying. So in order to prevent this, uh, we have to determine the physical characteristics values to describe the water quality. For this, uh, we are working on an on-site sensor system with is working with UV with spectroscopy. But uh, if you know, <laughs> I'm sure you know, every sensor-based system has an objective uncertainty. And if you have unstable operation conditions, which occur especially in the environment sector and on the on-site uh, sensor system, then this leads to an additional uncertainty. For example, uh, changing temperature or humidity can uh, also be a measurement uncertainty. So uh, it's really important to uh, include these measurement uncertainties for an optimized environmental monitoring. In order to do this, I'm very happy that uh, this mister, uh, I'm sure you all know him, Mr. Sade, invented the fuzzy set theory. So with this, um, we can include the measurement uncertainties by means of fuzzy methods. So uh, in this way, the assignment to a pollution substance is not crisply defined, but is categorized according to a grade of membership. And with this, we have a grade of flexibility and proximity to reality. But at first, to the methodical basics, um, the UV with measurement setup. Um, so UV stands for ultraviolet, and you can see it, so it's illustrated black. <laughs> and visible spectrum, as it says, it's visible. It shows you the colors of the rainbow. And we use a UV with light source and let it shine through a cuvette. So if we have water inside, as here illustrated, nothing happens. But uh, if we have a substance inside or some pollution, then the beam, a part of them, get absorbed. And which wavelength or color uh, get absorbed can tell us which substance is inside the cuvette. And also, the level of the absorption can uh, lead to the concentration of the substance. So this uh, we use for uh, our research. And here on the um, left picture, you can see uh, my laboratory where I take all the measurements. And we also uh, included uh, all these measurements in a submersible probe. So we can go on site and put it in the water and have um, all our measurement data there on the right time when we stand there. And uh, as already mentioned, we have a lot of measurement uncertainty. Here, uh, a few selections, um, desired temperature and humidity. There are also um, long-term drift signal noise that um, can, must be observed. 
So uh, we use the fuzzy pattern classification. Um, so you can divide a fuzzy log check by the day in a rules-based methodology and a pattern-based methodology. And this fuzzy pattern classification is a pattern-based methodology of fuzzy systems. Um, there are various of applications of fuzzy pattern classification. For example, um, it is used in the signal processing applications and automation systems, but also in the field of medicine, for example, in neuronal statements or medical diagnostic reasons. And you can find fuzzy pattern classification in machine monitoring, energy requirement calculations in the social field, and so on. So the uh, main special part of the fuzzy pattern classification is uh, to use a fuzzy membership function to create classes. Here uh, you can see the function uh, simplified for the one dimensional uh, case. And um, all the process is divided into a learning phase and a working phase. So in the learning phase, you have your recorded object data uh, with their characteristics. And at first, you divide them into quiz groups. For example, with a cluster analysis or a priori grouping or an expert based approach, or maybe you can mix some of them. You're really free <laughs> to do this into quiz groups. And after that, the quiz groups are transferred into, into fuzzy groups by this parametric membership function. We use the Eisenman potential function, as you can illustrate it see here. And for this case, uh, it's very important. Um, the parameter C describes the measurement uncertainties for each object. And after that, you have uh, all your uh, classes, fuzzy classes. Um, and then you're creating a one, a multi dimensional feature space with the multi dimensional fuzzy pattern classes. And in the end, you have a fuzzy pattern classifier where each class describes a character's state. So uh, in the pictures, you can see the process from the grips with the ASML function to the uh, fuzzy pattern classifier. And that's so the starting point for the working phase. In the working phase, um, there is a fuzzy identification with working data. And uh, yeah, there you uh, calculate a membership or a sympathy vector for each object of the work data. And this indicates the membership to all clusters that so looks uh, where it takes place. And the highest values, of course, indicates the membership of the respective classes. And security or risk of this decision can be determined by the difference in the membership values. So here you can see uh, an example uh, where class one displays a loaded state. And let's say we are uh, doing uh, measurement in August, and there our um, working data says uh, the membership value is 0 0.1. So it's okay, it's not, it's nearly class one, but it's not so dangerous. But then in September, we're doing our measurement again, and now our uh, membership vector is uh, 0 0.8. So it's really near to our class one, and we can say, okay, it's in the loaded state, we have something to do. So, uh, so much to the uh, methodical basics. Um, let's go to the research results and discussion. At first, uh, we need a database. So um, we were recording spectral data at different concentrations of benzene, naphthalene, uranine, and rhodamine D. These substances can be uh, associated to be um, respectively for uh, various pollutions. So um, as you can see, these are really different spectra. And we have on the x-axis the wavelength and in the y-axis extinction. And extinction is calculated with the help of a blank uh, according to Lambert's law. So at the beginning, we just uh, measure water and then uh, calculate the extinction with that. And the ex extinction depends on the concentration of the respective substance. So um, as you know, uh, know that in the learning phase, we need some characteristics. And so we need uh, first um, a mathematical description of our spectra. 
And uh, for this, I added a lot of Gaussian function. Um, you can see this here on the example for benzene. So at first we have the original data and to describe them, I add a lot of Gauss function. And yeah, so this in the middle picture. <laughs> and when you add them all together, then you have a good uh, mathematical description of benzene. And this uh, would, um, this was made for all uh, substances. So you have a mathematical description for benzene, you have it for naphthalene, for rhodamine B and uranine. And um, you have to do this once, for one concentration. And after that, you can fit this function over all the other um, substance spectra. So yeah, you're fitting the substance specific functions to the respective spectra. And with that, you can calculate the R squared uh, for the probability with which a certain substance is present. So this is characteristic one for our learning uh, data. And um, so this says, okay, there is this substance or this substance in that. And to say something about uh, the level of the concentration from the substance, there also was calculated the output of the maximum peak value of the extension spectrum. Um, and this is characteristic number two. So you can see uh, how it's, uh, a short extract of the learned data looks. But uh, if we go um, after that then in the learning phase. So at first uh, in the learning phase, we have to go into uh, crisp classes. And here you can see uh, the samples which are um, going with a priori grouping into the different existing classes. And so we have for each substance three classes. Um, first, the substance is unsurely present. Second, uh, the substance is present. And on a third, the substance is surely present. And this for all four substances. Um, here you can see it on the spectrum. And here you can see it um, already on the learning data with the characteristics, with the R squared on the x-axis, and the extension on the y-axis. So, um, and all objects which are surely present, also belong to the class present, of course. So in the next step of the learning phase, um, all objects from each class are grouped into one-dimensional fuzzy groups by the Asaman parameter functions. And these uh, for each characteristic, R squared and extension maxima. Here again, Z is the elementary uncertainty for the measurement uncertainty of the recorded water data. And after that, now all groups were, uh, for each character are transformed into multidimensional fuzzy pattern classes. So in this case, we have two characteristics, and so it goes two-dimensional. And we're using, uh, to do this all together, an Anfold compensatory Hamacher intersection operator. And on the right side, you can see the uh, fuzzy pattern classifier, which is built with these uh, four substances and three classes for each one. So, but that was not the final um, thing from the learning path. Um, we adapted uh, by using expert knowledge. So uh, our aim was to imagine very high concentrations. And so to do that, the class enlarged in the direction of the extension range. So uh, if we detect um, a substance with a really high concentration that is also included in the classes. Because when it's not included in the classes, then it says, oh no, there's no substance, and that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so here, um, now on the right side for you, I think, uh, you see the final FASI uh, classifier. And um, that you can now use, uh, it's programmed, and uh, now used for the working phase. So um, in the working phase, you start um, with, uh, again, that you um, make uh, some measurements. So you have your water data, you get your spectra, and again, uh, you pre-evaluate them. So you get your R squared and the extension maxima. And now uh, that uh, with this characteristic, it can go to the identification of the working data object. 
And here the class membership is automatically specified according to the highest membership vector. So on the left side, uh, you can see um, the working data with the characteristic L squared and extension maxima. And on the right side, there um, are our um, specificator. Now you look uh, from the upside. So <laughs> it's the same picture as uh, here on the right, but now uh, to see it better, you look uh, from above. <laughs> and yeah, the uh, working data is um, signals with the um, yellow cross. And there's also um, already uh, shown which the highest membership uh, vector is uh, illustrated and which class they belong to. So uh, this picture may be a little bit complicated. So I put again the um, example for benzene. So here um, we have uh, the example object from the working data with the characters R squared and extinction maxima. So we have here for benzene an um, R squared of 0 0.962 and an extinction maxima of 0 0.711. And the uh, uh, yellow cross show you where it's in the classifier. And after that, the, um, in the working class, we calculate the membership values to the class system. So here in the example, you can see um, all three uh, memberships for benzene. So uh, you can see it for class one, class two, and class three. And the highest membership value is here to class two with uh, 0 0.759. And so it can uh, say that the recorded spectrum detects the presence of benzene because uh, the highest membership value uh, goes to class two. And this you can do with all uh, your working data. So uh, in the end, you uh, have a differentiation of various character solutions. And after that, you uh, can uh, have a derivation of an immediate uh, recommendation for action. So you can do that. Uh, now you have to work, or you have nothing to work. <laughs> so um, in the conclusion, <laughs> no problem. Uh, we have here an approach for the characterization of water samples for on-site methods using fuzzy classification. With that, uh, we have more flexibility and more realistically modeling of the measurement characteristic values. Um, expert knowledge can also be included. And yeah, um, in summary, it can be used as an automatic classification of water sample data an on-site analysis with anticipation of measurement uncertainties. So uh, a little outlook because we are still working on this. We are still in the process. Um, at this moment, I'm already using a total parameter to describe the level of concentration instead of the extension maxima. So uh, we have uh, um, we don't use one value. So, uh, we use the whole spectrum to say something about the level. Then, of course, we are uh, also doing by right now, and we have to do in the future, we uh, need to generate a larger database so that we have um, more uh, data in the learning phase. Then, um, at the moment, we are doing some measurement of other relevant substances, uh, for example, such as chlorophyll. Because chlorophyll, um, with this, you can detect uh, algae growth, and that's very important at the moment for us. And we are also do some additional measurements with fluorescence instead of uh, absorption to uh, not uh, not uh, uh, yeah to detect even lower concentrations. So uh, with fluorescence you have a LED and no UV uh, light source, and there you have um, the um, chance to get a really low concentration of substances. And with that, we include several characteristics in the classification. So in the end, maybe we can um, do a three-dimensional or four-dimensional classifier. So this is what uh, we are working on. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And I'm open to all to your questions if you have. And yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Nice to see this uh, applied study. Um, I have 
one one question just you use the fuzzy logic um but is there a particular reason why you use this compared to for example uh, like a mixture of logistic functions to model it so what what would you say is the um, advantage of a fuzzy logic system compared to uh, like for example classical probabilistic model yeah so the aim is uh, to take the uh, measurement uncertainties and uh, in this way i thought that was the best uh, possibility to include them so if you go fuzzy you have uh, not a crisp uh, value you have the fuzzy uh, one for each object so you can put to each object your measurement uncertainty yeah but if you use for example uh, just like a probabilistic distribution that would be the same so have you tried to compare it for example against not that? yet okay. uh, but it's <laughs> in the working so i, I hope uh, it's Maybe the same or maybe better, <laughs> but uh, we are not uh, evaluated yet. Hi, how are you? Yes, nice. Yeah, because actually we use the uh, fuzzy pattern analysis. Interesting, interesting. Actually, maybe I think you can apply this to try to detect the COVID-19 because you, if you look at the nature science, they have a lot of some research paper is using the from the water. They try to find out the COVID-19 something. So one of my questions to you, I, I think you assume you're using the Gaussian uh, distribution in your in your data size. So do you have ever tried some other distribution, specific distribution things? Yeah. Okay. You are using Gaussian, right? I saw one 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 fifth feature after you are using Gaussian that match your data distribution. Yeah. In your Rico, I, I think it's too near oh. to your mouth. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Uh, for the peer evaluation, uh, that has nothing to do with the fuzzy pattern classifier. Uh, classifier. Um, so we are uh, at first we work with only one wavelength and one extinction because it goes a lot faster. But um, we recognize if we use uh, this uh, summary of Gauss function, this uh, we uh, play so that we can see the whole spectrum, and so it's. Um, when you have two substances in water, then it's better to um, commit them and get this characteristics. So uh, we only use uh, the uh, summary of the Gauss function. Uh, so just a very short question. Um, you mentioned the parameter C as elementary uncertainty of measurement. So I'm just wondering what does this parameter uh, include? Or what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, on the function or for the um, data? Uh, I think it was later in the presentation when you mentioned it. In yeah, like second so half. Um, I answer two things. <laughs> uh, at first, you uh, do measurement and certainly, as I said, for temperature, humidity, uh, signal loss. So you put this together and get a factor. And this factor would be in the um, function included. Oh. Doesn't work, but you uh, remember the isoman function that I showed. There was the parameter C, and then you put this uh, there and calculate it for each object. So you will look at each object. Okay, I have uh, this measurement and uncertainty, this, this, this. Put this all together into the C, and then uh, there you yeah, calculate the function. Okay, great. Thank you. Maybe just a short question from me. Uh, Given uh, the the whole setup of uh, uh, of this system, uh, how hard, how complicated, how costly it would be uh, to add, let's say, another substance that you want to uh, recognize in the water to the existing model? Uh, so you have, let's say, calibrated that for five classes, five substances that you recognize, and now somebody uh, issues a new regulation and you have now detect six instead of five. So what happens? Oh, it's not so much work. At first I have to peer relate the new uh, spectra, but after that I can use it uh, for the learning phase. I do it again and it's not so much time to do because the algorithm is written and you just put some new data inside. Okay, but uh, is that you just add another, let's say, piece, or you have to reconstruct the existing pieces so that 
they don't interfere with the new one? It depends on the application, I think. So uh, if you only concentrate on one uh, pollution, then you can do it uh, once alone uh, standing. Uh, but if you want to do it all together, then uh, you have to go on the existing one. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.